Hey, I'm Kevin Brown. Join me as I speak with Elizabeth Hackinson, CIO of Schneider Electric, and we discuss the impact that the COVID crisis had on her organization as we sent 110,000 people to work from home. So Elizabeth. Hi, we are, Kevin. We are here in West Kingston, right? In our lovely studio, as you can see, right? So thank you for coming down and spending some time with us. You know, I, I, uh, I remember, I don't know about you, but uh, this is the first time I've been back in the building actually since the COVID crisis started. The first day was, uh, the last day I was here was like March 16th, mm -hmm. today's June 2nd. And March 16th, I was sitting with uh, a colleague of mine saying, hey, you know, I think we're gonna have to work from home for a while, right? And it's fascinating looking back on what kind of denial you're mm -hmm. living in, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I'm just curious, uh, you're our CIO, right, of Schneider. And uh, clearly you were dealing with the crisis probably earlier than I was acknowledging that it was really going on. Can you just, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, how did it play out for you as CIO and uh, what started happening in China and then, you know, moved throughout the, the globe? Um, let me just start there. Well, I'd say it, it started for me, I was actually in Europe at the uh, maybe third or fourth week of January. And as I was flying out of Barcelona, uh, it, there was more news about COVID-19 in China than maybe, yeah. you know, we were hearing in the United States. And I'm on this plane that's packed and I see a lot of Chinese nationals uh, walking on the plane with, you know, masks on and I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. Uh, yeah. I landed in London. I started to then uh, engage more with the news. And, you know, clearly things were not good in China. And then I remember getting home and listening to the president of China saying, we have a grave situation going on. Right. And so immediately called our CIO from China, uh, even though they were still in the Chinese New Year, and, you know, said, Frank, what's what's really going on? And yeah, he yeah. said, this, this isn't good. You know, we're going to be quarantined. It means that we're probably going to work from home. So by early February, we started to assemble our global networking teams uh, because we overnight had to support our Chinese colleagues from working from home. So that means we needed to deploy more VPN licenses. We also needed to upgrade the um, data centers for Skype. Uh, so there was a massive undertaking, probably in early February, that a lot of people didn't know. Uh, we within IT were working on behind the scenes. And then of course, you know, I'm like you, I'm probably one of the last people in the Boston City Hub yeah. uh, around that time, March 16th, there's four of us in the office and, you know, we're beginning to hear that, okay, now, you know, everyone's gonna start to work from home overnight, even in Europe, who yeah. they're not used to necessarily working from home. Uh, so once again, we, we just, with the same team, you know, we thrust it into the rest of the world, similar things, increasing the number of VPN licenses. So in January, we had maybe 30,000 VPN licenses. By mid-March, we were at 90,000. Today, we sit at 113,000 VPN licenses to support over 100,000 employees working from home. Uh, we had to upgrade our data centers, uh, especially to, su to support video conferencing for Skype, and teams. Yeah. So just a massive effort was underway by our network teams around the world. Yeah. So if we just so we go back to when China started, right? And you talked about the VPNs. I mean, what you said, 30,000 to now we have over 100,000 100, yes. VPNs, right? Mm -hmm. And you went from, and in China, everybody went home. So what were the challenges that we had just, uh, just with China, just start there? What were the challenges that you had with bandwidth and with Skype? I mean, everything just worked seamlessly, I'm sure, right? There was, there was never any problems. Everybody went home and it was perfect, right? Uh, no. No, it wasn't. <laughs> so, okay. so um, you know, it was, it was just a learning, right? So we would look for where were their congestion points, you know, in the data centers. And so we would work with our big providers like AT&T, Orange, the local providers in China, uh, just to understand what, where were the, what were the traffic flows, what time of day. And so it, it really, if it wasn't for our partners who were helping us with these upgrades at congestion points, and of course it's bandwidth, it's routers, it's switches, uh, we wouldn't be honestly where we are today yeah. like any other company. So it was, uh, you know, there was a lot of learnings with, uh, with what we did in China. And then that just, again, migrated as Europe went to work overnight and North America. Yeah. And so, it, it, so you were able to stage it. So you learned a lot in China, yes. right? Yes. And so then we, when, the, when the crisis started hitting in Europe and then the yes. US, you kind of had a little bit of a blueprint. Yeah. We, we did, we what did. Was happening. Yes, and you know, people don't realize, but in most IT organizations, we're dealing with these kinds of challenges all the time. 
because uh, servers go down, routers go down. Uh, we always have an incident. So we had always practiced just through normal course of operations, our business continuity plans. But I would say what happened was it was the volume and the intensity that hit us you know, in China and then rolled through Europe and then North America. Yeah, so I'll give you, a, you know, the, 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 and I think we all have these stories of working from home and I was on a video call and then one of my kids started gaming and that kind of, you know, and then the question is, geez, is it me or mm -hmm. is it my network? Is it the kid gaming or is it something like Elizabeth didn't provide the right access for me? And, the, you know, and my point is, is that we talk about where these bottlenecks were, you know, was it always in the cloud? Did it tend to be in kind of our own sites? Where were the, you know, or so was it, it was, really dependent it was, on where It was you all were? over the place, right? So yeah. not only was it, you know, within our own data centers and data centers that our, our providers have for us, but, you know, clearly cloud providers were also struggling a bit. You yeah. know, they had the same, uh, I guess, uh, issues that everyone else was having with so many people working from home all, all hours of the night. Uh, we also had trouble with people, you know, at home, to your point, with home networks. Yeah. All of a sudden, kids are having to learn from home, and yes, they're watching movies. So we worked with internal communications to put out guides for how best to work from home, because we did find that while there was a large population of the company that was used to working from home, we found an equally large population that that wasn't used to that either. And so reminding people to turn on their VPNs, reminding people that, you know, you probably have to have a conversation with your family, like, you know, who's who's going to be, you know, on what times of day. And and so it really took, a, I would say, like a village, honestly. Yeah. You know, not only the employees helping us, but our network providers, our data center providers, our own employees. Yeah. And it's interesting because we've talked a lot, as you know, in the market when uh, with the infrastructure solutions we're putting together, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about mm -hmm. today, is about how the ecosystem needs to change, right? R particularly around edge computing mm -hmm. and the concept of edge computing. And so who did you see as some of it? You kind of mentioned some of them, right? But I imagine each part of the globe, we have different providers mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that we were working with. Mm -hmm. Can you go over, like, even just for one region, like, what, are the, what, is, what is the list of the critical partners that we had? So you mentioned network bandwidth and, the, yes. and those providers. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the cloud providers. Um, what about what we had on premise and how do, who else did we have to rely on yeah, to help yeah. us? As so we I would say, like, I look at this as a layer approach. So first of all, it was the internet that kept us all connected. Mm -hmm. And so any of the telecom players, and our two big ones are AT&T and Orange. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, without the heroic efforts that they had, you know, honestly, yeah. I, I think Schneider and other companies would be in the same situation because it was not just one company coming to them to increase bandwidth, it was all companies coming to them. So that was the first one. Then Equinix is another big partner of ours yeah. for the for the regional uh, interconnects. Uh, and so they were instrumental. So we used to process like one gig with them. We went to 10 gigs, uh, even in our data centers to handle Skype. Uh, that went from, uh, I think it was also maybe uh, one gig to 3.2 gigs. Yep. So tremendous, you know, tripling of, and, and 10 times capacity. Uh, we also went from 20 million minutes of uh, video calls per month to 60 million minutes per month. So unprecedented growth when you think about it. Right. And normally you need months of planning in order to increase any of this amount of bandwidth. And so without our providers, we, we just really wouldn't be where we are today. And I think what's important too is that we've picked providers that this is their core business. Yeah. So we, you know, we I think learned a long time ago as CIOs that we can't be experts in any everything. So we really need to uh, work with people that are doing this better than we can. Another big player was AWS. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they helped us set up all these VPNs uh, in the cloud pretty much overnight. Uh, we're very grateful to Microsoft because not only are we using Skype, but we launched Teams overnight for employees. Uh, and that was very effective. And now we have more employees wanting to, to move to Teams. So we're making that happen. Uh, and then Palo Alto is our firewall provider. So, you know, really it was a collection of vendors coming together. And, and also we had really good relationships with these companies yeah. as well. And I think that's another, you know, key thing is that when you're in these kinds of situations, you, you don't want to know who your account you, you want to know who your account person is on yeah, the right, other right, side, right? right? Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. not know and not be the first time you call them. Right, right. And so when you, uh, when we had to enable work from home, right? 
And, uh, and again, it's, to me, it's just a mind-boggling number of 30,000, 110,000. I know I heard stories, you know, you know, in different regions, it's different to, to work from home, you know. Like, you know, where I'm in Rhode Island, it was mm -hmm. probably one of the mm -hmm. easiest places mm -hmm. to be because yeah. uh, yeah. you could still go outside. But I think about India or some of these other areas. What it's, you know, can you go into more detail about what are some of the challenges that our folks had when they were working from home and, and how did it vary geographically because of bandwidth or infrastructure? Yeah. Or, yeah. So I'll kind of go through the globe. So yeah. again, China stood up pretty quickly, but then we moved into India. And mm -hmm. if you recall, India gave their people 48 hours basically to shelter in place. Right. And so we have thousands of employees, as you know, in India. And so all of a sudden that was a big change because they're used to coming to the office. You also know we have power issues in India as well. So it was getting our UPSs deployed uh, to employees at home, you know, in case there was a power surge. We also had a partner that supports our financial shared services, uh, and they never worked from home, but guess what? They needed to in 48 hours, and their people had no equipment at home. So here we are dealt with a, a problem from our finance colleagues to set up 700 desktops at the homes of and people. desktops, not desktops, laptops. Yeah, desktops, right? Yeah. Of, of people that aren't even our own employees. So, I mean, when you think about just the marshalling of, you know, our own people having to go home and figure out how to work, now we had to take care of 700 uh, people from one of our outsourcers and set them up and deal with, you know, their internet access and give them alternative means if, if they didn't have internet access. So it really was an amazing uh, set of activities that took place in India. And then when we moved to Europe, uh, they had a little bit more time. Let's just hold on in India for a second. So I'm curious. So the first, first of all, why desktops instead of laptops? Why well, because I think it was just easier for us to get, and it was probably a combination. We yeah. we had 48 hours to basically assemble whatever we could find. Because if you remember, India was shutting down everything. So right. distribution channels, trucking routes. So we scrambled to basically get whatever we could find. And we even took UPSs out of one of the labs. Uh, to deploy yeah, I'm still those. waiting for those because to come we, back. Because we way. couldn't, yeah. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like we had, you know, a month to order UPSs and ships. So it was the same thing between the combination of laptops and, and desktops. We were, you know, I remember Jean Pascal saying too, right? Like we, we, we were fighting the battle with what we had, right. not with what we wanted. Right. Right. So we were scrambling around finding infrastructure yes, because we particularly were. in India, the, the yes. power, having the UPSs. Were... Right. It's not reliable. Power's not reliable. Right. So, right. yeah. You know, and it's interesting because we've talked a lot about the resiliency at the edge, right, which mm -hmm. is the, the theory you put together. Right. And, right. I, and one of the things we've been discussing is now that people are working from home, that's an example where maybe home, the new normal, which I hate because everybody says, but is, uh, you know, now as a CIO, it's interesting to me that you were concerned about what's the resiliency yes. of the infrastructure in yes. somebody's house. Yeah, and that's why I said, even with, you know, when we talked about like the vendors early on, I mean, man, again, we need power, we yeah. need access to the internet, yeah. right? And then laptops and desktops can work, right? So we, we approach this always in this layered mindset yeah. of it's not just giving someone a laptop, but we have to make sure that the infrastructure is there. And again, a company our size, right, in 100 countries, 135,000 employees with over 100,000 needing to work from home. You know, it was, it can sound daunting, but I believe we had all the layers in place mm -hmm. uh, to do this and to respond as quickly as we did. Yeah. So I interrupted you. You were talking about India, then to go into right. Then we so moved. Then we moved to Europe, and uh, it was a little bit more than forty-eight hours. But what we encountered there was just people didn't know how to work from home. So we yeah. were getting interesting calls to the help desk of people saying, I, "I, I, I don't know what to do," and we'd be asking, "Well, you know, is your computer not working? You know, do you not have access to the internet?" And and they were like, "No, we have that. We have that. But but what's the problem? Well, my team isn't around me. Like I'm not really sure how to engage." Yeah. And so that's again. They were calling you. Well, they were. They were calling the help desk. Calling they were calling the, help the help, desk. IT help desk, right? Yeah. And so again, we worked with internal communications as part of this document. You know, best ways to work from home, and we had to talk about that. Like you have, you have Skype, you have Teams, you have Yammer. Like there's other ways to be connected when you're not in the office. And then by the time we moved over to the United States, you know, there's more, it's more common here yeah. to work from home. So, uh, and we had also practiced by now in China, India, Europe. So here, I think in the US, it was, it was much easier for us because we knew how quickly we needed to upgrade bandwidth, how quickly we needed to upgrade uh, VPNs. And then, you know, again, with our video platform, Skype is on-prem. 
yeah. uh, and Teams is in the cloud. Right. So we had more employees having uh, better luck using Teams connected yeah. to the cloud than having to be routed back to one of our data centers for Skype because we're on-prem where the congestion was. So that was the battle we were, we were constantly fighting was the bandwidth consumption. And we were learning you know, when are people coming online? Because even though, you know, you might work from home, if you have a, a partner that, you know, you've said, okay, you're gonna work in the morning and the other one's gonna work at night, that was happening a lot too. And so we couldn't always say to ourselves, well, you know, let's just manage on the time zone. Yep. We had to be more mindful of when were employees really working and it might not have matched to the assumptions that we made on time zone and geography. Yeah, interesting. So it was a con it was a constant. I don't want to say battle, but it was just a constant monitoring and a constant learning experience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That, so it's interesting. We talk about bandwidth. So bandwidth at home. Did you have examples of where you know we had to get you know the company had to help people get higher bandwidth from home in uh, order to be we're, able to we're, use video because video teams are one of these they use say two two megabits yeah, right yeah. you know or something yeah. along mm -hmm. those lines. Yeah. Did you have examples when we actually had to help we're, them we're, upgrade? We, a little bit, but we're experiencing more, it more now mm -hmm. because I think people were dealing with the multiple demands at home, right? Of kids getting online to learn, maybe a partner working as well. But right now we're getting out of India, Africa, other parts of Middle East, uh, where now that they believe people are gonna be working from home more long-term, yeah. where we're being asked to provide that last mile of yeah. internet access. And that's a discussion we're having right now. You know, how much do we get engaged in that? Are we going to be the help desk if yeah. something goes wrong with that circuit? So we're all trying to understand this right now and what the demand may be. Yeah. But, I, but I do think it's coming because to your point, there are countries we're in where there just isn't reliable even internet, Never mind, you know, power's a problem too, but then there's an internet problem as well. Right. So whether you want to deal with it or not, you're being dragged into now, not only do I have to manage my edge sites, yes. right? I've got to manage my edge the last, site. Yeah, yeah, the might, last mile. <laughs> might include the last mile down yes. to somebody's yes. somebody's home. Yes. And when you think about the equipment that they have there, right, uh, whether it's at home or whether it's in this office that we have here, um, you know, obviously we need to know what what is the equipment and what's coming on, you know, and how do you get the right balance of kind of the cybersecurity versus usability mm -hmm. dilemma? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was that a challenge? It, it is. And, yeah. you know, the one thing that we're doing is, I mean, we have a lot of endpoint security already pushed to people's laptops, uh, but we do need people to sign on to the VPN. And again, working with uh, internal communications, we're constantly sending out messages to employees to be thinking about cyber, you know, every time they power up their machine. Um, we also have a lot of employees, frankly, that are like downloading movies and, and other things. And so we're, we're also Over guiding the them. Yes, we're also guiding them that, you know, this is a work machine. And so yeah. we, we know you're, you know, in quarantine, but or, or stay at home orders, but it's, it's a learning process, right? And I think you said that earlier. So, you know, as we potentially work more and more from home, we're all learning, what does that mean, right? And I'm sure there's going to be additional security on certain laptops because we already thought about this with the financial shared services. Yeah. You know, that's a model where 700 people are normally in an office sitting a lot closer than we are. And so the nefarious behavior is probably you know, not something you see because you and I can look at which, what we're doing. Security through uh, proximity, <laughs> is that? But as, you know, people are home, you, you, have to, you have to worry, right, about insider trust. And, yeah. and so we're looking at other software right now that would help us to monitor exfiltration of, of abnormal data coming from, let's say, someone's uh, laptop. Yeah. So again, I think we're gonna see more, maybe security, uh, intended for a home office worker or home worker versus yeah. the office. Because in the office, we can control it more. We can control it more with segmentation um, and other tools. So yes, it's gonna be a, you know, a new world's gonna open up for us here. Yeah. And we're gonna live in this hybrid, right? I mean, this is, this so is what we're going through now. So let's talk about this hybrid. It's hybrid work from home, right? And we've had this, well, and I, we, you and I have discussed, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, kind of what's hybrid IT look like mm -hmm. in the future, and we've got this simplified view of three data centers will exist: of mm -hmm. you know, cloud data centers, regional edge, yeah, and the cloud, uh, kind of the, the, the local edge. Mm -hmm. But if you if you were to take a look, what do you think are the implications coming out of this? And you mentioned one, right? Because we were using Skype, well, mm -hmm. we still do, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. you have Skype that was mm -hmm. basically on prem mm -hmm. for us. 
And then to get the scalability that we needed to scale fast, you moved everybody over to the teams, mm -hmm. right? Because that was that was set. Mm -hmm. So, w what do you think are the implications there in terms of in the future? Do you think that accelerates us moving more applications into the cloud? And then, what's going to be left on prem? Is there yes. things that need to be on prem? I, I, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I, you know, I think there will be now an acceleration to the cloud, without yeah. a doubt. And companies who you know haven't even put their toe in being digital and monitoring remote, they're going they're going to do it now. Yeah. And if we just look at ourselves, we we were waiting for something called SD WAN, which is software defined networks, yeah. before we broke away from everything software defined right. now, right? <laughs> yeah, before we broke away from Skype on prem, right? We were waiting until early next year to do that. Uh, but then, you know, this hit and employees uh, were, were using Teams from home because, again, it routed right to the cloud. It didn't have to go through uh, our data centers like Skype, which was where we had the bottleneck. And so we had to sit back and say, you know, as CIO, I thought, oh, my God, I, I, as people come back to the office, I can't ask them to get back on Skypes, right? right? Skype, yeah. you know, I, I'm gonna, we're gonna have to figure out how to keep them on Teams. And so we, we basically talked to our network providers and we said, what would this take? And they basically said, well, you're gonna have to upgrade. Uh, how much is that gonna be? And, yeah. you know, they gave us a number, a couple hundred thousand a month. And I was like, okay, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Right, I mean, it was worth it, it extra investment uh, in order to move in the direction we wanted to anyway, yep. which was Teams and in the cloud, because we had plans to decommission Skype next year anyway. So it just accelerated our, our plans. And yes, we're spending a little bit more, but we feel like we're offsetting it on travel and other, and other things. Yep. So I, I do believe as, uh, as we all come through this new way of working, I, I, if you didn't believe in the cloud before, Right, uh, or, or managing remote, I think you do believe now. Yeah, you believe <laughs> so it now. You yeah. believe it now. So I do, you know, just like, you know, we're accelerating, you know, hopefully a lot of our customers are looking to accelerate as well. Yeah. And so, you know, the, what are the applications that you think you now in, will in the long run still stay on, stay on prem? And you don't have to go into specifics if you're not I, comfortable I just but... think, I, I think it might be legacy applications that yeah. are critical to still running your business. If they're already on-prem, they're probably going to stay there only because they're too costly to move. I mean, eventually they have to because they will become obsolete. But I think anything you can readily purchase um, on the cloud, you're going to do that for applications. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen a trend in the last five or so years. I mean, CIOs are not building applications anymore. Yeah. I mean, we might build small, you know, um, I would say add-ons, that attach to a big ERP, but for the most part, you know, cloud applications are the way to go. Yeah. You know, they're they're usually uh, you know certified, secure. You know, you turn them on, you configure them in less than thirty days. You pay by the seat. You have no infrastructure costs. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it, it just doesn't make sense to be building massive in-house right. apps anymore for, but, to run the business. Right, but now you, you, so you mentioned ERP, right? Mm -hmm. So that might be one that's difficult yes. for us. And if you think about it, then we're a manufacturer, right? Yes. So we have lots of factories. Yes. So you have process control systems running yes. in those factories, yes. right? So the, those applications would stay yes. on-premise, you mm -hmm. assume. Yeah, and they're legacy, right? Yeah, they're, they're mostly, all legacy. They're mostly yeah. legacy, right? right. So and uh, that kind of leads to an interesting question about the you know this edge computing right this term that gets uh, thrown around and just what I'm gathering from what you're saying is, um, you know, th there's a lot of people that are focused on where's the data and where's where's the compute going to happen. Yeah, IDC yeah. claims seventy percent all data will be processed at the edge. Mm -hmm. you no, know, yeah, know, yeah. We people can quibble yeah. and argue about what yeah. they mean by process. Yeah. But I guess, but from uh, I guess, my question for you is: from your your point of view, is it critical where the data is getting processed? It is now. Yeah. So it's funny you, you asked me this question because yeah. last week we uh, had some inquiries about what are these two hundred laws that China's working on now yeah. related to data and cyber that they expect to implement by the end of this year, and and one of them has to do with data. Yeah. They don't want data leaving China. Okay. And then when we started to talk to Pascal, who's our um, uh, chief uh, privacy officer in, in France, she told us, well, Russia's beginning to do the same. Right. And other countries may follow. So, Kevin, I think this is a geopolitical problem that everyone is going to face about not only where does the data reside, but also uh, systems 
Mm. So, you know, we're seeing more and more out of China. China wants cloud apps in China. Mm -hmm. They don't want like Salesforce hosted in San Francisco or, you know, even Singapore. So, you know, I do think that we're going to see just given what's happening around the world, big countries are most likely going to say, I want everything in country. Right. So if you all all the data and the and the privacy concerns because we already have GDPR right and we're dealing with that right right and how do you treat people's information right. where is it stored right so you've, it's almost is it almost it's, in my mind it's almost like a competing thing because the technology enables where the data could go anywhere mm -hmm. yeah right yeah. and you know what you're saying is yeah. it really is kind of a geopolitical yeah. issue yeah it is which it might is. drive the need to have yeah. cloud data centers yeah. and cloud apps yeah. Yeah. what about that type of concept of taking you know the, the cloud application but running it on maybe our own hardware. I think that's is good. It, I think is that, that a viable option? Is I think that it's. Something? I think it's probably where we're headed because yeah. I think if you look at you know two big countries, China and Russia alone, um, they will if they want to enforce these laws, they will enforce them, right? Yeah. And they will shut. You know, we call it, we we talk about the Great Chinese Firewall, which we still deal with every day. Uh, they control that firewall. They throttle it up. They throttle it down. So there are days that cloud applications that are based out of China, sometimes they uh, they operate really well, and other times they don't because yep. that that firewall is being throttled. So if you replicate right that environment in China, which is what we believe they desire, including their data yep. to stay within country, uh, that's probably where we're headed. Yeah. And would you ever want that on our own hardware so that we know where the data is? Or is a contract with a cloud provider enough to make sure that we're complying I, with I the really, laws? I really, I think is it that... probably depends on what yeah. the laws are, right? Like, right. I mean, we're hearing the number 200 laws in China right now coming from different yeah. ministries. Uh, and they're, they're data related and cyber related. So, so until we can unwrap what they are, uh, I think it's too early to tell. But uh, I, I, I do think we're going to be faced with some uh, new challenges. The tough questions on that. So it's uh, so it's interesting. If we get into this, and our you know now the data is being driven by geopolitical events, right? You know, you got people working all over the place. Um, is bandwidth really the most critical thing to ensure that it's up and running? Uh, yes. Yeah. I think it. You know, it's power because I think we can't yeah. lose sight of you know the number of countries that we all operate in yeah. that still don't have reliable sources of power, right? So I yeah. still think that's going to be. Uh, in some countries, key, and then yes, then we've got the access to the internet, and then we have bandwidth. But I, I'm quite optimistic that, given what the world has just done, I mean, if you just step back and think about these network providers, right, and what they've been able to achieve, achieve overnight, almost yeah. in every country, uh, it's enormous. Now they're going through big build outs as well, right? Yes. Like more data centers are being built, more colos are being built. Yeah. All right. And we'd so, like to help them. And we'd like yes, to help them, good. of course. So that's what I think we're going to see, frankly. I, I do believe they'll, you know, that will build out more uh, because we're telling them to some degree, right? Big companies are coming forward and saying, you know, we're gonna have our people work from home permanently or until January 1st of 2021. I think yeah. schools are really trying to assess universities. Yeah. You know, are they coming back? So this is a good signal, I think, to that market because they got us through the first big tsunami. Yeah. But if this stays long term, then yes, there will be more build out, there will be more bandwidth and data centers required. Yeah, and it's, the power is interesting. The, the reason I was asking that question or going in that direction is, you know, I, I remember years ago, uh, I went and I visited a customer and I walked through their data center. And it was like what you consider mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. like, and I said, let me see your wiring closet. And they didn't want to show me. Right? <laughs> and when I sh they showed me the wiring closet, I understood why. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Because it was, yeah. you know, we have pictures of these famous mm -hmm. wiring closets mm -hmm. where it's yes. just a rat's nest. Yes. And, yeah. You know, we all have them, by the way. We all, we all have them. <laughs> Do you think, you know, if, if it's becoming so important that the network's available, probably, you know, arguably more than maybe it was in mm -hmm. the past, right? Mm -hmm. I, my, my perception always was, and, and as I've been doing this for a while, is people kind of would neglect the wiring closets because it was okay. Do you see those as becoming more mission critical yes. as part of the infrastructure? Oh, yes, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because if everyone needs to be online, they need to be running. So, you know, I, and I remember going into these data centers and seeing the network operations center, right? You know, and you've seen these with the, the big yes. screens on the wall. And, yes. And, um, 
and I would ask him the same question. He said, what about the wiring closets? What about the small server rooms, right? Somewhere in here mm -hmm. in our building, mm -hmm. we have server rooms. Yeah. And, and yeah. they never seem to manage them yeah. to the same level. So, yeah. I'm, you know, are we guilty of that? And if so, does it, is there new challenges that this presents that we didn't anticipate? I would say that every large company has this challenge, and we yeah. do as well. And, and I'm glad you brought this up because we have about 700 server rooms in our ecosystem. 700 server rooms. 700 server rooms. After because we've made this massive push to putting things into the cloud, we still have 700. Yes. Yes, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cobbler's children, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but that was driven by the real estate, right? right? Over 750 office locations. So uh, last year we had uh, an incident and it made us really look at what are the conditions of these server rooms, right? And so it's not until you go and look that you understand what you have. And again, talking to other CIOs, and I've had this in other companies, we all, we're all faced with this challenge. Uh, you walk in, there's not proper access control. You might not have UPSs that have enough battery life in them yeah. to sustain. You might have issues with alarms for power, for circuit issues. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to say that we, were, we started to lead an effort last year with the energy management team to go in and of our critical server rooms, make it completely eco structure. Right. So all of our own products and services are going into the rooms that we actually want and need to keep. And then we'll be closing down other server rooms. But even now, and you mentioned circuits, I was looking at some of our reports from using uh, EcoStructure Data Center Expert, yeah. and you know, we always get a lot of power alarms. That's that's pretty frequent. You know, a server is in distress and and it's related to power. But we do find circuit issues, yeah. and that advisor helps un uncover that for us, so that if we do have to dispatch someone to that location, we know why they're going. Because temperature control, we can address remotely, mm -hmm. uh, and other things we can fix remotely, but something like a wire, you, you, know, you physically have to go in yep. and fix that. So I do believe that, you know, again, we're gonna be at a time now where all CIOs are gonna be looking at the infrastructure at large, and I think we're not the only company who's gonna be looking at our real estate portfolio. Uh, and once you do that, you then start to uncover well, what was in that server room? Why do we need that server room? Uh, oh boy, that looks pretty ugly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might need to keep it, but maybe it's time for an upgrade. And so I would actually like to work with you know, our teams in energy management as yeah. we upgrade these rooms because we can really showcase you know, how did we transition from the legacy and, and maybe not being at the level of monitoring that we needed Yep. to where we are today, and what's the benefits that we're getting from using our own advisors and other tools? Well, and that's part of, you know, as you mentioned data center expert and IT expert are, you know, because we actually, you know, as you know, we re-architected re mm -hmm. those to, to run in the cloud, mm -hmm. and yep. part of it yep. was to, to help solve the, what, what we perceived was using technology mm -hmm. available, mm -hmm. right, that came from mm -hmm. gaming, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm to try and make it easier to manage vast numbers of right. small installations. Right. Right? That was really the target mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. we were going after. And that's also why I asked you about data because we've had some customers who are concerned about, you know, the UPS and the, you know, the, the infrastructure data that we get, they're concerned about that data being going into the cloud, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, how are you treating it? How are you handling it? Yeah. And one of, the, one of the things would be, and, and we, you know, we obviously address mm -hmm. those concerns mm -hmm. and talk about it. But one of the things that we're interested in is, uh, uh, and we're seeing some early signs of this, is that because of what the world has just gone through and mm -hmm. is continuing to go mm -hmm. through is, some of those concerns are getting alleviated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because they need a solution in mm -hmm. order to help, um, independent of the geopolitical mm -hmm. thing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, challenges that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. Um, you know, so it's really an interesting dichotomy because using the cloud and leveraging big data and mm -hmm. leveraging mm -hmm. analytics, mm -hmm. we can get more predictive, we can mm -hmm. help more, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you have to address these new concerns that come mm -hmm. up around where's the data, data going, right. where's the cybersecurity, right. how are you really going to charge me? Right. You know, if it's, is it my data or is it your data? Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. are all questions yeah. that the yeah. industry now needs to answer that maybe we, yeah. we didn't need to in the past. Yeah. I think we have to get smarter on the data yeah. too because, you, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't, no one asked where's the data, yeah. even if it was a big corporate system for HR data, right? If you had a data center in, I don't know, Poland, yeah. and that's where all the HR data was for the entire company, nobody really 
cared, yeah. right? I mean, there was built-in security around that environment. You know, and now I think we've swung the other way. And I think we've got to understand what is the data that needs to be protected, right? Everything doesn't need the same layer of protection. So you know, I think, you know, again, countries, companies, we all have to get smarter on what is that data that really can be in a, in a cloud. Uh, it doesn't matter where it is location-wise. And then what is the data that you maybe need to keep in country? So do you see, you know, do you see possibly, and this is just pure speculation, of course, but uh, do you see possibly we may end up in a world where the cybersecurity people in the IT department need to start recognizing that there's different types of data and maybe there's yes. levels of that we and, can put And we in already place. are. And is I think, happening? yes, yeah. it is happening, right? Because if we probably implemented uh, these general laws around data privacy, we'd probably shut down. Right, right, <laughs> so, right, right. so we had to start, and, and that's why hiring a data privacy officer two years ago, we, yeah. we did, right, with Pascal, uh, she helps us think through, yeah. you know, what is the data, you know, yes, it has to be protected, it has to be secured, we work really closely then with the cybersecurity people to make sure that we we put a blanket or some kind of umbrella around that data. There's other data that doesn't need that same level. So there's a lot, at least you know, in our company, of the data privacy and the cyber people working really closely together. Yeah. Well, and it's um, you know, it it becomes quite complex, right? You take the 700 the remote closets mm -hmm. and now people working from mm -hmm. home, right? And if you now are going to be responsible to ensure that my internet is working appropriately, mm -hmm. right, you're going to be yeah. asked and dragged into a whole bunch of different, we don't know what they are, but it's good. Yes. Your, your job is going to change. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 It'll, it'll look different. Instead of, you know, architecting for co corporate office locations or satellite locations, mm -hmm. we're going to be in a hybrid. Yeah. And, and I do believe potentially the work from home uh, morphs potentially yeah. those corporate locations. I mean, time will tell, uh, but the world has proven right. to some degree that we are functioning. Yeah, and so it's, it's uh, and it's, uh, and, and I've talked about this some in the past, so is that there was this, I remember 10 years ago sitting in conferences and, 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 and as far as it's true, is that cloud computing was gonna simplify our lives, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. know, and I joke somewhat, there's a mm -hmm. rhetoric about, you know, in the future, there'll only be one big data center and mm -hmm. everything will just be served mm -hmm. up from there. I mean, mm -hmm. I, obviously, yeah, somewhat yeah. of a joke. Yeah. But um, is the reality of where we are right now is, is that the world's actually much more complex, right? Because you've got more endpoints to worry about, more devices to worry about. You yes. have on-premise applications. Yes. You have cloud applications. Yes. You've got bandwidth providers that you have to, yes. which you always had to deal with, right? But now it's... They're in, they're in your critical path in your critical path. So do you think an implication, one of the things that we've been working on is, um, you know, thinking about if the world's getting more complex and you got more, but your, your staff, I know we're, we're doubling your staff this year. No. Is that what I heard? No, is we're that, not. No, you're not. So you're not, <laughs> so you're being asked to basically yeah. deal with more complexity, yeah. arguably yeah. with less staff, yeah. right? Yeah. So the partners become more important and you said that. Yes. And this is something that we've been trying to, yes. you know, how do we start, we've been working on with the products and the, the mm -hmm. solutions that we provide yes. is, you know, is there a way with, uh, you know, we just announced monitoring dispatch services, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that now a customer, if they want, they have mm -hmm. the option where we'll help monitor mm -hmm. the infrastructure for mm -hmm. them. And if we mm -hmm. see there's a problem, mm -hmm. one monthly bill, we'll go out, we'll take care right. of any problems or mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. um, are you, you know, so that's a, a little bit of a plug for what we're doing, but mm -hmm. is, are you, we just talk a little bit more. Do you see the relationship with partners changing as a result of this? I mean, you talked about how helpful they were and how much they did, but do you see other examples where you might actually be relying on them more? Than I do in the believe. Past? I and, do and, believe so because, to your point, look, IT part, IT departments are not going to double overnight, and we're not going to get double the budget. So we're going to have to be smart in what we do. And so if there are um, uh, activities that we can continue to outsource, so if there is monitoring. Uh, and somebody can do it at scale better than we can. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at that. So I do believe partners, this ecosystem is going to get larger, yeah. right? And I and I do believe over time there's been more trust, right? You remember the days of private networks, mm -hmm. right? We 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 would never when the internet was first launched, right? No, we can't put our corporate apps on the internet, right? right, right. And look where everyone is today, yeah. right? So I I think as as technology has evolved. 
so has the IT organizations. Because if we had to do all of this alone, I mean, I, I, we'd have 20,000 people in IT yeah. in, in Schneider Electric, and that's, that's not the right answer. So yes, I think that is a great you know, point that you're making, that I do believe partners become uh, more important, but we're gonna pick partners because they do it really well, yeah. right? I don't need to go to someone, a provider, who's trying to do everything, yeah. because then they'll look like me. Right, right, trying to do everything. So that's why I, I, I feel that you know, we have been fortunate in that we've picked the right vendors. They are really good at what they do. Right? Yep. When you look at these network providers, they've been around for you know, decades. They have mastered what we are asking them to do for us. Right. So that's why I feel you know, no company should get too wide in yep. its services because then it becomes diluted. So we'll continue to look for those that um, you know, are, are definitely in the top tier, just given what we do, right? We support yep. critical infrastructure, so I never want to you know, be in a situation where I have to you know, share with GSC that, uh, sorry, that plan's down because I, I picked a, you know. GSC is global supply <laughs> global chain. Global supply chain, right. You know, our, yeah. manufacturing yeah, our manufacturing plans. Yeah, that's plans, our, our internal right? term, right? yes. So, yep. so those are, uh, you know, so those, so, those are, you know, big decisions, right? That um, all CIOs need yeah. to make because our global supply chain leader certainly doesn't want to be checking, you know, did a, did we pick the right, you know, partners? So yeah. yes, I do agree. The partnerships become, you know, more and more important and valuable as we go forward. Yeah. So we just talked about a bunch of trends, right? People working from home, uh, the movement towards uh, applications running in the cloud, mm -hmm. right? The uh, 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 the for like the criticality, right, of wiring closets yes. and the entire infrastructure, yes. not just uh, where where the big data centers yes. are. Mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, so we're a manufacturer, right? Is when you talk with these other CIOs, are they dealing with the exact same thing, or does it vary greatly depending on what what industry they're no. in or what I mean, segment? That's they're a in? that's a great question, and lots of people think it varies, but it really doesn't. Yeah. We're all dealing with the same set of issues, and whether you're a CIO managing 200 people or 2,000 people, it's the same set of issues, which yeah. again, people don't believe, but, but it is. The only difference sometimes is in our buying power, right? right? But it's, it's, it's the same, like how do we, you know, going through your trends, it's how do we secure you know, everyone working from right. home, right? Yep. It's, it's how do we all get to the cloud faster than maybe we were moving at, yep. and now I do believe there's probably more support Yep. Uh, even within the company to get to the cloud, yep. right? So it's, uh, it's you know, I, I really believe this is a tremendous opportunity for those that really want to accelerate. Right. Because th it's it, like everything's there. It's the perfect storm. Yeah. Right? So, uh, so just as a wrap up, you know, if you had to give us three key takeaways, right, as a CIO coming through this experience, right, working at a manufacturer like us who, you know, provide solutions into people like you, you've mm -hmm. got a very, you know, mm -hmm. complex position here, but uh, what, what do you think those, what would be three key takeaways for everybody? As we come out of the tsunami? Just where we are right now, our conversation today. What would you... I, I would say that we we really have to figure out this hybrid environment, yeah. right? Of because we're 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 whether we like it or not, we're we're going to see people working from home long term, and we're going to have to figure out how do they how does that hybrid work with the office workers, yeah. right? And what are the what are maybe additional assets that we have to get to people at home. Two, I would say that there is going to be a massive acceleration to the cloud. Yeah. The, uh, you know, it is the time to, you know, we talk about legacy and decommissioning, but, you know, we have to do that. Uh, and that includes server rooms, right? Yeah. It, it, it's cleaning up, you know, the yep. stuff and, and fixing the stuff that you, you got to go clean you out to, your sock drawer, yeah, as yeah, we like to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I guess, you know, the third would be um, what new services will come out of this, right? And I think as CIOs, we probably want to lean in more with our partners to say, what is it that we need in the future? Because to yeah. your point, there will be more pressure on CIOs. And again, I, I can't double the staff, I can't double the budget. So what do I need? What are those additional cybersecurity solutions I need for the home worker? Um, how, do I, how do I package up maybe uh, internet, uh, better power sources for the home worker, 
Yeah. Right. Like we haven't, we kind of ignored the home worker, right? Yeah. When you think about it, it's like, yeah, yeah you want to work from home? Yeah. Here's your, here's your laptop. Good luck. You know, good luck. Right. Yeah. That's, that's not anymore. So that's why I think there's an upper, there's really an opportunity there for us to articulate more of, you know, what is it that we see we need? Yeah. Well, and it's funny because I, I joke about the people in my generation. You know, if I, if I go home at night, I, I used to say, is if the internet access was down, I viewed it as a small vacation. But if the internet access down and my kids come home, it was a major mm -hmm. emergency. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and uh, part of part of I guess my question for you is: Are we get are we moving to a world where IT, you know, IT is actually now mission critical for everybody yes. all yes. the time? Yes. Yes. And, uh, and and really, the challenges are quite unique, yes. no matter where you are in the globe. Yes. Yeah. yes. But the need is the same. The need is the same. I mean, it's always on. That's the expectation, right? right? I have that expectation of myself, right? I, I know, I and always, so do I. As, I, I as, always, I've, <laughs> as I've harassed about you in the past when my iPad yes, didn't work. Yeah. Right. But that's, but that's, that's the world like, we're living in. And if you think of the generations behind us, that's like all they know. Yeah. Like they, landline, they don't even know what a landline is. I mean, yeah. you show 20 year old a desk phone. They're like, what, you know, what is this? So, oh, the rotary. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know, we're way past that now. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think it's really exciting time right now for technology, uh, for CIOs. You know, we've, we were, you know, we go up and down, right? Like there are yeah. times like, you know, CIOs are at the forefront and then other times, you know, we're in the background and this has launched us to the forefront again. Yeah. So we've had to get through the tsunami. I think most most of us did. Uh, but now we have an opportunity to craft what's the future. And, yeah. and again, I think we've got to work with our partners to, to help them understand uh, what we need. But they're also probably experiencing the same, yeah. right? Because yeah. uh, they're doing the same for their companies. Well, that's great. Well, so, you know, as I'll tell you, it's, first of all, you guys did a great job because, you know, Thanks. at least from my standpoint, you know, you know, when we moved the teams, things were seamless, you know, Skype was a little touchy at times mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll, from my own personal mm -hmm. experience, but no matter what, it's still much better seeing somebody in person, yes, you know, it until is. there's 3D teams or it's something right. to replicate that. Right. Even the guys behind the cameras here, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's good that we're able to start coming back in and getting, great. getting back to us. Yes. A more regular environment. So thanks very much well, for coming you, down Kevin. and really appreciate it. And okay. uh, that's some great insight for us. Okay. okay. Thanks.